This week I got a message that was not unlike messages we'll get throughout the week, often as pastors and through the church. And it was a description of a life that would be probably very much like a life that some of you have walked through, some of you are walking through, hard life, struggles, fighting off times of, of very low points. And one of the questions that was asked in the message was, do you ever feel abandoned? Do you know what it's like to feel abandoned? Because I often feel abandoned, they said. They said, I'm looking for God. I just can't seem to find him. So we're singing, I thought about that message. God just brought it back to my mind because in my mind I just visually saw what it used to be like. It used to be that if the people of God wanted to be near God, they had to send a representative in who, if he were in right standing and had done everything he was supposed to do, could cross through the veil and he would go in. He would stand before God for the people. He would hear from God for the people. And then he would go out and report to the people what had happened. And the Bible tells us that what Jesus did on the cross literally tore the veil away. And no longer do we have to feel on the other side of something keeping us from God, but we see that all the time he's been there. If you think about that picture, it's God behind this veil who's saying, you just can't get near me because of who you are. There needs to be something between us because of who you are. But in the grand scheme of things, God was always there. He was always in the same place. It was the people who wandered away. It was the people who abandoned him. It was the people who didn't obey. It was the people who didn't follow him. It was the people who worshiped other gods. He was always there. And then the veil just revealed the fact that I've never walked away from you. I've never left you. I've never left you as an orphan and I never will. I've never abandoned you. And I just, I felt like as we were singing that song that there are some here who maybe you're like me and one of your parents left when you were young. And though you would say, ah, it didn't really affect me that much. The truth is there's always been somebody who left. Maybe you're like many of you who sit here and a spouse looked at you at some point and said, I don't love you anymore. And they abandon you. Maybe a friend walked out of your life. Maybe a child said, I'm done. And you come in as someone who feels abandoned. And God had a message for you and for me and for all of us tonight, and that is, I never walked away from you. I wonder if we could just sit in that just for a moment. I've never walked away from you. You needed to come the first Wednesday of December because God wanted you to know, I've never walked away from you. I'm never going to walk away from you. I'm not going to abandon you. You can't do anything to separate me from your love. You, you can push me away. You can run away. But like the father in the story, I'll be standing in the road going, there's my son. There's my son. He's coming back. Because the son left the father, but the father welcomed him back. And he's saying to him, like we can say, I never walked away from you. Never walked away from you. Let's sing that together. I never walked away Oh, you never, ever, ever walked away from me. Oh! 
fact that even when we feel abandoned, God has never abandoned us. That even when we feel under the weight of this life, he said, my burden is light and my yoke is easy. And so if you're feeling the pressure, it's not from God. It's probably from yourself. It might be from somebody else, but it's not from God. Hey, why don't you give everybody around you just a high five. Tell them you're glad to see them at first Wednesday. If you're here at First Wednesday, actually in the room, I want to challenge you to something for our January First Wednesday. I want us as a First Wednesday group, I feel like we are a group of people that have a secret and that no one knows the secret, and it's a secret that we can tell, and that is that First Wednesday charges us up for the month. I don't know about you. I don't know. But I look forward to First Wednesday for a while. I look forward to coming and being able to have some extended worship time and just being able to sit in the presence of God. And, and so here's what I want you to do. We have ID3s. You guys know that, ID3s. We identify three people who are far from God, but they're close to you, and we bring them on the weekend, and the growth of our church has been because of you inviting people. Why don't we do this? For First Wednesdays, we're going to ID3. We're going to ID3 people who just don't know how good First Wednesday is. And they're close to you. And let's get them here in January. Because I think if they'll taste and see what's going on here, it's, it's going to be an incredible moment. I hate that they're missing out on it. Because I feel like first Wednesday, I think I've told you all this before. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm super planned out on my sermons. I'm a little OCD about being planned out on my sermons. But for first Wednesday, I, uh, I just kind of throw all that out of the window. And I let my inner Cody Burbage come out. And I get creative and I get, you know, introspective and just kind of allow things to kind of happen. In fact, today I went to lunch with Pastor Robbie. And we were talking in the car, and I told him all about what I was going to be preaching about tonight because it kind of come to me this morning. And I was like, that's it. That's it. And then I told him in the room just now, I said, yeah, I'm not talking about that at all. I changed it again before we even got here. That doesn't make it any better. Okay, that doesn't make it any better. I, I don't think that makes it better. It's just different, switches things up. But I feel like God gives me some stuff to say at first Wednesday it's a little different from what we say on the weekend, and, and so it, it's important. In fact, the fact that I changed it mid-afternoon might make it terrible. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if it was God or if it was lasagna. It was one or the other, and we'll see which one it was. But do you, do you guys know, are you aware of the fact that we are an offended culture? Like, have you noticed that recently, that we as a culture, as a people, are offended every single day. Someone is offended by some new offense. I mean, there's something to be offended. I saw this meme on Facebook the other day. I think we have it. It says, good morning, America. What will you be easily offended by today? Do you guys ever, ever realize? I mean, it's just like every single day, something new to be offended by. And here's the truth that's kind of hard to swallow sometimes is that we as Christians fall prey to it as well. Every single day we're offended, offended, offended. In fact, a lot of the counseling that we do as pastors, a lot of the conversations that we have when marriage disputes and friend disputes and family disputes and just inner struggle, a lot of it is in response to offense. Offense. And uh, we are easily, easily offended. But here, here's something I've learned. Offense is an event. H how many of you know if you live long enough and you interact with enough people, you will suffer offense? I mean, right. you just go to Walmart and you're going to be offended in, on. in, in one trip. Like you just, somebody's going to offend you with something. But offense is an event. But offended is an attitude. It's an attitude. It's a choice. It's a choice. And see, we can walk through an offense and choose to not be offended. Offended. So, so what we see is just, just offended. And Proverbs 19.11 tells us something. It says, 
Sensible people. How many of you want to be sensible? Come on. How many of you want to be sensible? You want to be sensible? One person not raising their hands, they want to be unsensible. They're like, no, I'm just not going to raise my hand anytime you tell me to. I don't care what you say. <laughs> tell me I could have money, I won't raise my hand. Sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by, look, overlooking offense. They, they just kind of go, I'm not going to be offended by that. I, it's an event. It happened. But I'm not going to live in that. So that would tell me that people who don't do that aren't sensible. And the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be sensible or wise people. And, and so if you kind of extrapolate that out, then it's a sin to be offended and to live in this state of being offended. In fact, living in an attitude of offense really makes you, makes you small. I mean, that, that steps on my own toes a little bit because I'm just like you guys. I not only let it be an event sometimes, I, I, I let it be an attitude. And, but it makes us small. And small people don't get big opportunities. Mm. Small people don't get to walk into big things. So small people don't have the opportunity to have God do something big in, in their lives. But the deal is, is our attitude, being offended is an attitude, it affects our altitude. Mm. It affects how high we can go in life. It affects how high we can kind of walk through the day. I mean, when you're always offended and everybody's making you mad and everybody's done something to you and everybody's out to get you and everybody's talking about you and everybody just doesn't respect your Christianity, everybody doesn't respect your political bent and no one wants to listen to your opinion. When you walk through that, you're, you're just looking down, looking down instead of living up above of the fray. And I think that God is calling us as a church and a people to be above it, to be above all of that, to be above all the, the chatter and uh, above all the offense and above all the you offended me and you don't agree with what I agree with and you, you don't like what I like and you don't sound just like me. He wants us to be above it because we have, we have a purpose. And, and then you, you look in Isaiah, another scripture that just jumped into my mind as I was thinking about altitude it says that both, but those who trust in the Lord, they trust in the Lord. Connie talked about this past weekend, trust. We've got to trust in God. We've got to trust that he's going to do an incredible thing in our lives. We've got to trust that the, what seems like bananas thing that he's calling us to is, is going to work out. We've got to trust that he's got best for us. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. New strength. Do you, do you ever feel weary? Just kind of worn out? Just kind of over it? Just kind of beaten down just a little bit? What, what the scripture tells us, we can find new strength. That, that says that the old strength wore out. We got to find some new strength because we're in need of something new. But he says we can find new strength. He says, they will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and they won't grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. I was searching the internet last night looking for something and I stumbled across fainting goats. Have you guys ever seen fainting goats? Yeah. Has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but I just thought when I saw that word faint that they are hilarious. If you haven't seen them, you should go look at them. They faint from fear. Sometimes Christians are like that. Mm. You know, just walking through life. Somebody scares us just a little bit. Hey, you can't eat at that chicken place. Whoa. Hey, you can't have that opinion. And talk. Whoa. Just pass out. We're wimps sometimes. We really are. We, we grow, grow weary very easily. It's because we're in our own strength. We, we need new strength. We're down low. It says we can soar like eagles, and we won't grow weary, and we won't be faint, and we won't be complaining, and our altitude will be higher, and our attitude will be better. 
And so we won't live in this state of being offended. But truthfully, a lot of times we just can't hang. And I think God called us to something so much greater, so much grander than just being offended and walking through life being offended. But, but the, the truth is, I, I heard T.D. Jakes say this one time. So I wish I could say it like, T.D. Jakes, I wish I could do it like T.D. He said, God will promote you to the level of your tolerance mm. of pain. That's good. And some of us, our tolerance is really low. God called me to do this. Oh, it got hard. Uh, fainting goat. God, God wants me to do this, but it got hard. Uh, oh, I can't do it anymore. I mean, I'm going to be a leader. If I'm going to be a leader, people are going to complain. They're going to critique me. They're going to say things about my leader. Uh, I can't do it. I can't do it. We, and then we just, we grow weary, and we walk away. And see, you, you can't, if you can't take it, you won't get promoted. I believe if you're showing up here on a first Wednesday that you probably want promotion in life. <laughs> promotion in, in your every area of your life. I'm not talking about just at work. I'm talking about promotion as a better husband. I tell Connie all the time, I want, to be, I want her to say, you're the best husband. Not the best husband for me. I want her to like look at her friends and go, he's better. He's the best husband in the world. That's, that's what I want. I probably won't ever get it. But that's what I want. That's what I want. I want promotion. I want to be the, the best that I can be at, at what God has called me to do. And you can't get promotion. You can't tolerate. If you can't handle it, you won't get opportunity. What, what did Jesus say? He said, he said, if you do well with the little thing, I'll give you the bigger thing. If the little thing makes you go, huh, I'm froze up, then you're never going to get the bigger thing. And see, when we ask for promotion, we are asking for problems. Mm. Biggie had it right. More money, more problems. More promotion, more problems. And we're asking for it. Now, think about it for just a minute. So we ask for promotion from, from dating, let's say, I, I, if I'm a young man or a young woman and I'm dating, and I go, I want to be a husband or wife. I want to be promoted to a husband or a wife. You're, you're asking for problems. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm saying if you will be promoted into something that is as important as marriage, you are going to have problems. And people go, I'm just not ready to be married because it just doesn't look like it would be easy. Then you don't want promotion. Because when you ask for promotion, you're asking for problems. So, some of you, I don't know if you're here. If you, if you, this, this word just kind of came to me. You've been dating her long enough. Put a ring on it. Get married. Be promoted. Come on. All right? And just, just Maybe that's a word. Maybe that's a word for somebody. Some of you complain about being an employee. I want to be a manager. I want to be a leader. What you're asking for is more problems. You think your boss has it easy. He doesn't have it easy. She doesn't have it easy. She, she has it harder than you do. You just don't know it. You don't know the pressure and the, the, the weight on them. There's more problems. From acquaintance to friend. I mean, you know, when, when you get inside the friend zone with somebody, you get to find out all kinds of stuff you didn't know before. From a distance, everybody looks so awesome. From a distance, you guys look at me and go, he's incredible, he's so cool. You get to be my friend, you're like, he's a jerk sometimes. Like, like he, he actually, he's not as cool as I thought he was. You get, to, you get to kind of get in this a little bit tighter with people. You go, wait a minute, they're not nearly as squeaky clean as I thought they were. It's a promotion, but it takes problems problems from acquaintance to friend. If you're going to make these jumps in life, if you're going to have this promotion in life, you have to put on your big boy and your big girl pants. In the words of the great theologian Taylor Swift, shake it off. Shake it off. Somebody likes Taylor in the house. Hey, so when we ask for promotion, we're asking for When we ask for opportunity, 
Here's what we're asking for. If you want opportunity, and I think, again, if you come here on first Wednesday, you're, you're part of our crew, you're part of our family. When you ask for opportunity, you're asking for offenses. I want an opportunity to lead. You're going to be offended. I want an opportunity to step into a bigger role. You're going to be offended. I want an opportunity to have a voice. You're going to be offended. And if you don't want to be offended, then you should say no to the opportunities. Because you're going to get offended. A, A great marriage will grow during offense. Connie and I were talking yesterday. We had our quarterly meeting with our, our counselor, and the, the, we meet with, uh, as a staff, we let our lead team staff members and their spouses meet with him. He's one of our overseers. His job is to make sure we're healthy. If we're not healthy, you're not healthy, so he's going to make sure we're healthy. And we were talking about, we said, you know, it seems like every fall, our life just gets very hectic. And during that season, something always seems to happen. There seems to be relational challenges. There seems to be ministry challenges. There's just something that this is a weight on. If we look back over falls, it just looks like that. But we were saying, it, this fall, we're healthier coming out of it than we've ever been in any previous fall. And we're, we're better coming through it. And so what we're saying is we're starting to learn to grow through the offense. Some of the greatest growth moments I've had is when I've had to go to Connie as my spouse and the woman that I love and go, I blew it. I offended you. Can we grow through this? Some of the greatest moments have been when she's been able to say, well, it was that once when she was able to say that she offended me. It was that one time. It's that one time. No, she's, we've grown. We've grown through offense. In your marriage, you'll grow through offense. A great employee will grow during offense. A great friend will grow during offense. It's not easy. It doesn't feel right. It's not easy to walk through the offense. It doesn't work itself out immediately, but you grow through the offense. But see, the small, they, they can't take on big jobs. And there's nothing worse than putting a little person in a big position. There's nothing worse than giving the favor and the, 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 just the unbelievable presence of God on someone who's not ready to take on the opportunity that brings offense and to take on just the unbelievable uh, pain that will be associated with what's going to be in their lives, the problems that will come. And so for, for many of you, though you are to be soaring like an eagle in life, you're not. Because you're so busy dealing with your offenses that rather than an eagle, you end up acting like a chicken. Mm. You're, just, you're just putting all your energy into your offenses. We collect so much offense that we are using all of our energy dealing with the pain, all of our energy managing the sleepless nights, all of the energy managing the unforgiveness, all of the energy getting all offended. And so we're walking around, supposed to be soaring like an eagle, we're squawking about our neighbor, talking about our coworker, and then we get all excited. And you know that chickens try to fly? Have you ever seen a chicken try to fly? And they're like, and they get all excited, and they try to, dust goes everywhere, and they look, what do they look? They look silly. And see, when God meant for you to soar like an eagle, and you're walking around being offended at everybody, and you're walking around squawking all the time, and you're walking around with your head down, eating anything that comes in front of you, it it just doesn't look right on you. And it's time for some of you, listen, I want to pastor you because I'm pastoring myself. It's time for some of you to go, I want to soar like an eagle, so I'm going to forgive them. I want to soar like an eagle, so so I'm going to get above it all. I'm going to soar like an eagle, and so I'm going to take flights. I'm going to get way up high, above all of the fray, and I'm going to forgive, and and I'm going to say, I'm not going to live in a fence. I'm going to let it shake off. I'm going to walk through a fence. For some of you, you you can't be the wife to the husband you have because you still are offended by the husband you used to have. Mm. You got to shake it off. 
And that may be the same guy, maybe a different guy, but it could be a changed guy. Come on. We've got to shake it off. We can't be soaring if we're chickens. When you've been conditioned to act like a chicken, you can't fly like an eagle. To be unforgiving is like you drinking poison and then waiting on them to die. And so I just, I was sitting in my office and I was working on a different word for tonight. And I just, I felt like God said, no, this is what I've got. You've got some people that are ready to soar like eagles. They're ready to take flight in a way that they can't even imagine what God can accomplish through them. But they're so busy believing that they have the attitude of a chicken, they can't soar like an eagle. Just challenge them. Forgive. Walk through the offense. Let it be an event, not an attitude and not a choice. Stand up straight. Take your battle to the air. The eagle, when it wants to kill something, it goes and it picks it up, <laughs> takes it up in the air where it can't do anything. It's defenseless. The eagle knows the air. The eagle gets it up in its space. And then the eagle does business with its prey. What I'd say is God says, take, your, take all those problems that seem so relevant down on earth, that seem so relevant in your life, all the offenses that feel like you should be offended by them, all those things. Bring them up to a different level and way up here in God's environments, God's atmosphere. You begin to realize they're not as powerful as they look like. That it's not as important as it felt. And then you can soar. And you know why we're to do this? Because who should have been offended? God. Who should have said, I'm not tearing the veil. I'm not getting rid of that separation. You don't deserve to be near me. Who should have said, stay away. The only one who has the right to be offended is God. And yet he tore the veil by Jesus coming on a cross. And love on a cross changed everything. Mm. Love on a cross said, not only am I not offended, I forgive you. And I send my son to die for you, to show you the amount of love I have for you. Mm. Love on a cross found Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. What if every now and then we just follow Jesus in that, and when somebody offended you, you just went, they don't really know what they're doing. Hurt people hurt people. Maybe they were just confused. Maybe it was just a bad day. <laughs> Maybe who knows what. But if Jesus can look at us from a cross and say, they don't know what they're doing. If they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't do it. Then maybe we could cut each other the slack. I forgive you. I, I make room for you. And I love you. And I'm not going to walk through life offended. Tonight as we worship, I really feel like that the cross as a instrument of death for Jesus, but a symbol of hope for us should be a place that we all spend some time at tonight. I don't think there's a single person here, myself included, that didn't walk in here carrying some offense. And that offense, maybe it's new, and maybe it hasn't had time to be anything other than an event yet. And then for many of us, there is offended it's weighing heavy on us. It's become a choice. It's become an attitude, and we're walking offended. The cross is the place that we leave that. So I want to challenge you during our response time. Just go over to the cross, if that's you, and just write offended 
on a piece of paper, put it up on the cross and go, I'm leaving it here. I'm no longer offended that they left me. I'm no longer offended that they hurt me. I'm no longer offended that they said that to me. I'm no longer offended that they fired me. I'm no longer offended that they tricked me. I'm no longer offended that they hurt me. I'm no longer offended because offended is a choice and I choose today to let the cross carry the offense. God, move among us. Be with us as we repent. Father, we thank you for the cross that is a symbol of restitution, for the cross that is a symbol of hope. It's a symbol of forgiveness. And so God has forgiven people. Let us forgive. God, we ask as we respond to you that we would remember that it is because of your body broken and spilled on a cross that we find favor with you. We choose to walk no longer in offense. We choose to accept the love that came on a cross. God, meet with us now in Jesus' name.